Good morning. Welcome to our service of morning prayer. And just to say to you, in accordance with GDPR, I have to inform you that the service is being recorded, but you are not all in shot. Uh, but just to make you aware that it's been recorded for later transmission for those who are at home who cannot uh, attend church at this time. We begin with the greeting. The Lord be with you. Um, our hymn, our opening hymn is Come Down, O Love Divine. Uh, during this period uh, of transition, we're not allowed to sing in church, but uh, we are allowed to uh, listen to recorded music, and you can hum along to it if you like. And the hymn, the first hymn, Come Down, O Love Divine. We'll be seated for the hymns. Christ, we come together to offer to Almighty God our worship and praise and thanksgiving, to confess our sins and to receive God's forgiveness, to hear his holy word proclaimed, to bring before him our needs and the needs of the world, and to pray that in the power of his spirit we may serve him and know the greatness of his love. Let us confess our sins to God our Father. Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed. 
through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault, by what we have done and by what we have failed to do. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may serve you in newness of life, to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy on you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. O Lord, open our lips. God, O God, make speed to save us. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord. Please be seated now for the first uh, reading, the psalm, and the second reading. The first reading is from Genesis, uh, chapter 25, beginning to read at verse 19. These are the descendants of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean of Paddan Aram, sister of Laban, the Aramean. Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren, and the Lord granted his prayer, and his wife Rebekah conceived. The children struggled together within her, and she said, If it is to be this way, why do I live? So she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and the two peoples born of you shall be divided. One shall be stronger than the other, the elder shall serve the younger. When her time to give birth was at hand, there were twins in her womb. They first came out red, all his body like a hairy mantle, so they named him Esau. Afterwards, his brother came out with his hand gripping Esau's heel, so he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. When the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man, living in tents. Isaac loved Esau because he was fond of game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Once when Jacob was cooking a stew, Esau came in from the field and he was famished. Esau said to Jacob, Let me eat some of that red stuff, for I am famished. Therefore he was called Edom. Jacob said, First, sell me your birthright. Esau said, I am about to die. Of what use is a birthright to me? Jacob said, Swear to me first. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank and rose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. This is the word of the Lord. The appointed psalm is Psalm number 119, beginning to read at verse 105. Your word is a lantern to my feet and a light upon my path. I have sworn and will fulfill it to keep your righteous judgments. I am troubled above measure. Give me life, O Lord, according to your word. Accept the freewill offering of my mouth, O Lord, and teach me your judgments. My soul is ever in my hand, yet I do not forget your law. The wicked have laid a snare for me, but I have not strayed from your commandments. Your testimonies have I claimed as my heritage forever, for they are the very joy of my heart. I have applied my heart to fulfill your statutes, always, even to the end. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever, world without end. Amen. And the epistle reading is from Romans 8, beginning to read at verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do, by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and to deal with sin. He condemned sin in the flesh, so that the just requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. 
For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. To set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For this reason, the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh. You are in the Spirit, since the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is alive because of righteousness. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also through his Spirit that dwells in you. This is the word of the Lord. We stand and we say the canticle uh, Te Deum, part one, uh, by half verse. We praise you, O God, we acclaim you as the Lord. To you, all angels, all the powers of heaven. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might. The glorious company of apostles praise you. The white-robed army of martyrs praise you. Father of majesty unbounded, your true and only Son. reading from the Gospel according to St. Matthew, chapter 13, beginning to read at the first verse. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the lake. Such great crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat there, while the whole crowd stood on the beach, and he told them many things in parables, saying, Listen, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path, and the birds came and ate them up. Other seeds fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil, and they sprang up quickly since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no roots, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Let anyone with ears listen. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what is sown in the heart. This is what was sown on the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet such a person has no root, but endures only for a while. And when trouble or persecution arises on account of the word, that person immediately falls away. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the lure of wealth choke the word, and it yields nothing. But as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and yields in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. This is the gospel of the Lord. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. The parable of the sower very conveniently provides us with its own uh, interpretation. Uh, Seed, the word of God, is sown in various conditions, and according to the ground on which it falls, the people who hear it, it either prospers or it dies. 
And even without the interpretation, anyone with a basic knowledge of gardening would understand the symbolism in this parable. The hearers of the word are either shallow or rootless, distracted or finally deep and receptive to it. And it's tempting to look at all these different types of hearers and ask ourselves which group we fall into. Are we shallow and easily swayed? Are we lacking in endurance? Are we too busy surviving to think of the deeper things of life? Or are we well grounded and nourished, fertile ground for the word to take root? Whatever our answer, perhaps a better question to ask ourselves is this. What are we doing to prepare the ground so that the word of God can take root and bear fruit in the lives of others? It is all too easy to resign ourselves to the inevitability that for some people God will never be a part of their lives. We criticize the rising tide of secularism and atheism. We despair at those who say there is no God or at least see no place for God in their lives. We speak sadly about the diminishing numbers of young people in our churches. And yet we fail to ask the obvious question. Does it have to be this way? Or perhaps to rephrase the question in a more challenging way, what can I do to change things? It's important to ask this question because we are not just observers. This parable is not just for our amusement, our entertainment, our enlightenment. It is for more than that. It is actually a call to action. It is not just describing the Christian life. It is trying to lead us further into the Christian life. We are participants in the gospel, and this gospel is a call to action. Jesus didn't tell this parable just to describe the ways of responding to God's call in our lives, but rather to draw attention to our particular calling as his followers. And for each of us, perhaps it will have um, a different import, a different impact uh, in our different and individual callings. What is, what is our calling? Obviously we have individual areas in which we are called, but what is the overall calling of the community of faith? It is, we're told, to make disciples of all nations, or in other words, to make Jesus known to everyone we encounter in our lives. Now that might sound very straightforward, but it's not, because we do it in a society which is hostile to that. It's countercultural. We live in a society which increasingly wants to say to us that faith is private, that it's a matter of our individual devotion and fulfillment. We have religious freedom, we can practice what we like, but we shouldn't bring it into the public square. Who are we to tell others about this Jesus? What's it got to do with anything? And the tragedy is that we have largely given in to this pressure and allowed the gospel to be marginalized by being ring-fenced into some sort of private domain. Ironically, and it really is ironic, in the lockdown, faith began to seep out into society through electronic media, when more people than ever before engaged uh, in following or worshipping uh, than, than normally do uh, physically on a Sunday, uh, on a weekly basis. Uh, faith uh, sort of, uh, as I say, was squeezed out of one arena as our churches were closed, but it found a new home. And in doing so, I think actually something has happened which perhaps um, will not be entirely reversed because it challenged the notion that we Christians belong behind locked doors, separated and far removed from the real world. The truth is that the message of Jesus is personal, but it's not private. It is of its very essence public. Jesus was and is political. Look at the very beginnings of his public ministry in the synagogue in Nazareth, as recorded in Luke chapter 4. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. Bear in mind the context of this, in the context of Roman oppression, and try and argue that Jesus did not preach a radical political message. And this isn't an isolated passage. Look at the Sermon on the Mount, 
and you see the same upturning of the social order. Yes, Jesus is about the salvation of our souls, but he is also concerned for our bodies as well. He cared and cares about life before death as he cares about life after it. We must fight against the privatization of the gospel. Archbishop Tutu once said that if we are to say that religion cannot be concerned with politics, then we are really saying that there is a substantial part of human life in which God's will does not run. If it is not God's, then whose is it? That's a stark question. If it's not God's, whose is it? So the gospel doesn't exist in a vacuum. It has and had and continues to have deeply practical implications. So a vital part of our calling is to prepare the ground for the word of God. We expect far too much of people if we think that they will become followers of Christ just because we tell them that it is the right thing to do. The great theologian Walter Brueggemann once said that people are not changed by moral exhortation but by transformed imagination. And maybe when we realize the truth of this, it will release us from a burden because it just may be that we're trying too hard or maybe we're trying to do the wrong thing. We're trying to make clones of ourselves when we are really called to make followers of Jesus. How many of us, when we give off about the disinterest of our children and others uh, who have lapsed, as we call it, uh, how many of us are really sharing the difference that Jesus makes in our lives on the other six days of the week? Young people in particular are hugely sensitive to integrity and genuine commitment. And however much we preach the importance of going to church, it is a futile exercise if what is read and said and sung and prayed and preached is not rooted in and motivated by a love of Christ which is enacted during those other days of the week. And I think that is the real crisis the church faces today. It is one of integrity. We're calling people into an institution when what they are looking for is a relationship with God, a transformative relationship that empowers them to be the people that God wants them to be and to do the good things that they are able to do. We're not engaging effectively with spiritual hunger. We're not in the marketplace. We're not sharing the vision. We're keeping it to ourselves and denying it the air it needs to breathe and to flourish. And perhaps we need to learn from our experience of the lockdown where we started to engage uh, with uh, more social media, uh, with video and uh, uh, streaming services, etc., all these things. Maybe that is something that needs to go on. There is no reason we should not have a voice in the marketplace, in the public square. There is no reason that the gospel needs to be locked into these beautiful uh, buildings Sunday by Sunday. It needs to be set free. What we're called to is very simple. The contemporary theologian Steve Chalk puts it like this. It is not our job to make anyone believe. Our responsibility is simply to love God and love others. Our communities are transformed because through us, God walks our streets, feels their pain, hears their cries and responds to their needs. So we have to walk our streets. We have to feel the pain that is out there. We have to hear the cries and we have to respond to the need. It is in this way that the ground is made receptive to God's word, that it may be holy ground and we truly exercise our discipleship of Jesus. May we follow him and in that following, inspire others to walk in his way. Amen. We now have our second hymn, and again we remain seated uh, for the hymn. And the second hymn today is Oh for a Thousand Tongues to Sing.
stand and we proclaim our faith in the words of the Apostles Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ God's only Son our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit born of the Virgin Mary suffered under Pontius Pilate was crucified died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Show us your mercy, O Lord. O Lord, guide and defend our rulers. Let your ministers be clothed with righteousness. O Lord, save your people. Give peace in our time, O Lord. O God, may clean our hearts within us. We join together in the Colic for Peace. O oh God, the author of peace and lover of concord, to know you is eternal life, and to serve you is perfect freedom. Defend us in all assaults of our enemies, that we, surely trusting in your protection, may not fear the power of any adversaries, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And we continue in our intercessions, in the bidding, Lord, in your mercy, the response, hear our prayer. We pray for our church. We pray that as a church we may respond to our calling to share the good news in different places, to go outside beyond the walls and the boundaries of our churches and our communities, to reach out to share that love, that gospel of hope, of healing, of reconciliation. Give us courage, give us strength, give us wisdom, but most of all, give us your love. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for our world, a world 
broken by division, by greed, by pursuit of individual happiness and success. We pray for all those who are suffering through the coronavirus and its various impacts. We pray that as peoples and societies throughout our world, we may reach out to all those who are hurting, all the vulnerable who suffer on the margins of our society, all those who are hurt first when there is greed and violence and self-centeredness in our world. Help us to spread your message of mutual love, of interdependence. We think of the model of the body of Christ, how it binds us together as church. And perhaps we can extend that into our world, look upon all its peoples, whether Christian or otherwise, as parts of the body of creation, of God's love, and so extend them the respect and care they deserve. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for our own community, for its own particular needs at this time, for those who are suffering through illness or anxiety, those who are coping with loss at this time, Pray for those in hospital and those waiting tests and surgeries. We particularly ask your prayers for my son Aaron, our son Aaron, this week as he has important tests tomorrow. We think of anybody else in our community who is facing any challenge in their lives at this time. We pray, Lord, for your healing your strength and your comfort. We pray that you would use us as bearers of your love and your healing to one another. Lord, in your mercy. And in a time of silence, we bring before God our own particular and personal concerns, knowing that he does listen, that he will answer, it may not always be the answer we expect, but he is there for us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we continue in our closing words. Merciful Father, accept these are our prayers for the sake of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. We now sing our last hymn. This would be the hymn of the offering, but there is no offering uh, today. There's a retiring collection just due to the COVID restrictions, so there's a place in the back of the church if you wish to contribute. But our final uh, hymn, I the Lord of Sea and Sky.
The Lord be with you. Let us bless the Lord. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Just to say, uh, we have a visitor with us this morning, and you're very welcome. Um, remind me of your name? Florence. Florence, 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 delighted to have you with us. I'm afraid we can't have coffee after church because of the COVID, but uh, hopefully you get a chance to meet a couple of people. You're very welcome.